Welcome back to another Telltale video. I'm Greg. I'm Emily. And this time we, I am, we are moving forward with kind of like we've been doing with Philip K. Dick. We're trying to cover all the works of H.P. Lovecraft. And we have already done a number of works. Mm -hmm. We've kind of jumped around. And we have a cat joining us. <laughs> Hello, Henry. This but is Henry. This is Henry. Mm -hmm. The ginger boy. <laughs> My pumpkin Looking kitty. for some loving from, <laughs> from He's Henry. like, I want you, but I don't. <laughs> I want to love you, but I don't want the lovings. So, everybody loves cats. Every booktube video has to have a cat. Yes, <laughs> and I have three, but this one decided yeah. to be social today. Hi, well, the other two are around here somewhere. Yeah, Cyrus is laying over here by my computer. Yeah. <laughs> Just chilling. Out of camera sight. And the other one I know is here somewhere. Yeah. She's probably laying in her tube over there by the bookshelf. Oh, Henry's going to go bother her. Or Cyrus. Yep. <laughs> go bother your brother. Anyway. Anyway, yes. Um, continuing our... Uh, we're, we're going kind of... We've kind of gone back to the beginning. And we've Looking already done four... Three Lovecraft stories in his early career. This is number four, mm -hmm. the transition of Juan Romero. Another from, story that takes place in a cave. Well, of course. Or a mine shaft. I think it's a mine shaft technically. Well, it's a cave. It's a. It's like a, almost like a sinkhole opened up from a mine shaft. Yeah, it was <laughs> a mine shaft that became a sinkhole into an abyss. Anyway. So this was written. In 1919 but it wasn't published first until Arkham House published it in a book called Marginalia of, of unpublished Lovecraft works in 1944 okay so you want to do the synopsis yes okay <laughs> now that do you know synopsis. what it is I was having a really She's hard time because two Lovecraft <laughs> stories both take a place in caves I was mixing them up for a while it's like we did with Ho William Hope Hodgson yeah I know it's like <laughs> too many the night, the dawn, the voice in the mid-afternoon, who knows? Anyway, so the transition of Juan Romero starts with a man who was at one point stationed in India, whether it was for a war or colonization or some kind of empirical reason. He was stationed there and had some history there and had obtained a particular ring from a shaman and was very attached to the ring. Um, then he got reassigned and was sent over to South America or Mexico or something. Central America, maybe? And while he was there, a uh, Mexican man who hardly knew English saw the ring and somehow, or for some reason, unbeknownst to the ring bearer, I will call him, whose name I don't think we ever get. I don't think we ever get this narrator's name. No, I don't No, think so. we don't. So the ring bearer basically now has a loyal servant in this Mexican man just because he saw and was very affected by the ring. So over time, they kind of form this relationship where the guy basically becomes his assistant. And one night, there's a huge storm. The dogs are howling. Nature in and of itself is in an uproar. And then the Mexican starts having this horrific sensation and, like, starts freaking out and says, uh, in Spanish, what is that sound? And so the guy's like, what, the wind or the wolves? He's like, no, from the ground. And so they kind of start listening and paying attention and trying to, like, not kind of let go of the other sounds. And yes, sure enough, there's a drumming in the deep, as Tolkien would say. So suddenly, Juan just, in this crazed rage or whatever, jumps out of his tent and bolts into the mine shaft. Straight up just bolts into it. Now, like, the day prior or something, I realized I forgot. The day prior, they had done some demolition, and this opened up a sinkhole that was in the mine that they couldn't see the bottom of, and people were kind of superstitious and weirded out by it, so they decided not to go in. Anyway, back to the main storyline. He bolts into there. Ringbeard runs after him, trying to figure out what's going on with, his, with Juan. And then the last thing he sees is Juan basically, like, not looking like himself at the edge of the precipice of this sinkhole and there is orange flame-like stuff coming out of this hole then there's an enormous uproar a lot of sound he loses consciousness mm -hmm. wakes up in his bed as if no one as if nothing happened no idea how he got to his bed the ring is gone and juan's body is still in the cave 
has been recovered, mm -hmm. but is far beyond what it used to be. Very distorted, <coughs> not he, not very human looking anymore. And no one else seems to have heard the thrumming. Mm -hmm. That's where the story ends. Mm -hmm. Creepy. Yeah. So a lot of things happen in caves. Avoid caves. <laughs> I'm really just getting this Lovecraftian theme of we need to avoid caves at all costs. Well, I think when you keep when you go through and you read a lot more Lovecraft, you you find that he had this he built this whole fantasy of all these things in places where we haven't explored. Yes. In caves, in Antarctica. Places um, that humans probably sea, shouldn't be in the first place or wouldn't think to look. Coming from outer space, mm -hmm. that there's this whole horrifying mythology. Also potential for like saying, hey, maybe Hollow Earth is a thing. There seems to be a, a lot of, of reference to like Lovecraft thinking Hollow Earth is, is a thing. Yeah. I mean, that played a role in... Um, Mountains of Madness? In the narrative, of Arthur, narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, I came across. Yeah, there was a some Hollow Earth. Where it was yeah, talking about Hollow Earth theory. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people that thought that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who still think that. Yeah. Wow. Well. <laughs> there's a lot of ocean we haven't covered yet. So. Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, but it's it, very interesting. It was very interesting for that, but I don't think this one. It kind of hints at what's to come. It it's, hints that hell's down there. It's a cool story, <laughs> but it doesn't go as far as his later stories. Mm -hmm. It just kind of hints at what you would come across and at the sorts of things that you would come across in later stories that mm -hmm. you would write. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it has a, a big theme. I don't think it has a big idea. I think it, it is just. just meant to be spooky. It's kind of, kind of a little more like. Well, like, it, honestly, some of the ho more horrific science fiction stories of H.G. Wells. Mm hmm Very similar, yes. Like the Platner story, where he comes back and everything's reversed. Yeah. Doctors check him out and everything has been inverted. He's been in another dimension. Mm hmm Very cool H.G. Wells stories. It's very mm -hmm. creepy, though, but it's, it's about that kind of human transformation. Yes, from yes. From forces beyond our control. Yes. And the unknown, those forces beyond our control that we still don't know what they are. Yeah. Though there was pretty big hints that that was hell. Mm hmm So, Mexican was possessed somehow. Yeah, well, that's Mexico for you. No. <laughs> They're always getting wise. Mexico, great food, just great food. Bad caves. <laughs> lots of superstitions, bad caves. Lots of don't smoke the peyote. Yeah. Don't, yeah. It's craziness. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, too, because I feel like a lot of Mexican culture is very obsessed with death and, like, spirits and things like that. So it's kind of fun to have that element brought into it. Um, also, really interesting that the ring had some kind of universal symbolism to this Mexican man in order for him to want to be serving the uh, colonizer ring bearer whatever we want to call him so to speak well the story came from a conversation between lovecraft and J.R.R. tolkien did it really no that would be funny if it did <laughs> but it what is if the there is ring? one ring to rule them all <laughs> and then yeah so basically like this mexican goes golem and just like throws himself in the pit yeah. <laughs> to be course. back with the hellions i guess or whatever i don't know it's yes there's there's a lot of like there's definitely a lot of Tolkien in this story. <laughs> yeah. It's hard as a reader not to find all these illusions that probably aren't even there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a fun story. It's a good spooky one. I really don't have a ton to say about this one other no, than like, it's, it's, it's just a, a fun read. A really good minor R Lovecraft work. And, yeah. Um, he has I a lot of really underappreciated works. It is in Dagon and other macabre tales. And I got a digital copy of the complete works of H.P. Lovecraft that it was in as well. And it's course, also available yeah, online. H.P. I mean, Lovecraft has a website. What was the website? <laughs> there's the HP, HPLovecraft.com literally has it on the site. 
Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you can find it there. Project Gutenberg. You'd have to find it. I tried to find it in Project Gutenberg, but I think it's within one of, like, the magazines. Because several magazines popped up and then things that weren't relevant when I looked it up on there. So it's oh, probably it's because in... it wasn't published until 1944. Okay. So it's under copyright with Arkham House. Oh, okay. Well, it's available on hplovecraft.com. Yeah. So feel free to read it there. Free access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, Barnes & Noble has a complete H.P. Lovecraft volume, which is really beautiful looking mm -hmm. in their, in their leather fantastic. bound editions. And There's there are a, a number lot of, of them now. He's yeah. making a huge resurgent in the last few decades. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay. good stuff. So that's oh, it. Enjoy like it. Us, uh, subscribe to us. Come on back for more. Leave comments. We want to hear from you. And until next time. See ya. Bye. Bye.